There is a next level of foolishness for us. Now, I didn't get no claps when I said that. In our praise, when, when, when you do certain things, okay, like, la, 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 if you believe that, shout amen. Why are we doing that? Because that's what redemption does? Because if any two agree together in the earth, do you know what the word amen means? So be it. So when I'm telling you God wants to heal your body and you shout amen, you and I are coming into agreement and so be it on the earth as it is in heaven. I just wish somebody would say amen. See, here again, it's not just church culture. It's a, it's, there's powerful reasons behind what we do. When I ask you, lift all over your hands, lift, lift, all over the room, just lift your hands now. When I do that, why? Because it's the universal sign of surrender and victory. Raising your hands has dual meaning. Universally, all over the world, it's the sign of victory. Universally, all over the world, it's the sign of surrender. Surrender to God and God brings the victory. When we lift our hands, there's something wonderful that happens. Uh, the Bible says that Michael looked on her husband, David. Guys, when I tell you a next level of foolishness, this ain't my message yet, I'm just building up to it. When I'm telling you a next level of foolishness, David was a king, okay? He disrobed himself down to his underwear when they were bringing the presence of God back into Jerusalem because the Ark of the Covenant was stolen under Saul and Saul didn't care enough about it to go back and get it. And there's another message. All the priests kept going through all of their functions although the Ark wasn't even behind the curtain. Everybody just kept going through the motions not even knowing God wasn't even there. I don't wanna be that church. But David cared about God's presence, so he went and retrieved the Ark of the Covenant. And when they were bringing it back through the streets of Jerusalem, the capital, the Bible says he disrobed and danced before the Lord with all his might. No pageantry, no pomp, no red carpet, okay? The trumpets were not blowing in the air. There was no military salute. This guy said, no dignity today in front of the presence of God. I'm going all out. And I'm going to tell you something. I believe that was an ugly dance. Uh, all, uh, with all your might dance, I bet there was arms and legs just going everywhere. That couldn't have been pretty. And his wife, the Bible says his wife saw him from the balcony and hated him. And talked about how undignified he was acting as a king. And the Bible says from that point forward, she was struck barren. So I tell people, when your life is barren, what do you need to do? Dance. Everything has a reason for it. Whatever we ask you to do, there's purpose behind it, okay? When I'm talking about next level in our praise, praise is God's mechanism for, I believe, breaking pride because you can't do it the way God said do it and be full of pride. It's impossible. I think that's why now all of our songs that are written are worship. We try to bypass praise because praise is foolish. In Acts chapter two, when all of them were praising and speaking in the Holy Ghost, the onlookers looked in and said, these guys are drunk. I wonder how many churches you could look into today and everybody say, them guys are drunk. Not many, because nobody gets that foolish. We're too polished. Got too much status. We've had too many successes. We got too much education. There's a next level atmosphere waiting on us. But it's gonna take a push in this area. There's a great warfare that goes on in your praise. In the natural, remember the Old Testament, everything is outer 
physical, natural. New Testament, it's all inner, invisible, and spiritual. Same stuff. One you can see, the new covenant you can't see it. In the old covenant, praise through enemy into confusion. So in other words, we know that Satan's kingdom is highly organized and is highly strategic and they do not fight against each other and he is not divided. You have to go to church to find that. Satan does not, is not divided against himself. Okay? And over and over again in the Old Testament, they were getting ready to go in with their swords and shields and God said, throw them down and praise. And when they praised, the enemy turned on each other because it thrown through them into confusion. Okay? What you don't understand is everything that has been assigned a street strategically against you. When you open your mouth to foolishly and unashamedly praise God, you are rearranging things in the unseen realm and you are, the enemy that is organized against you, you are disorganizing his strategy. Come on, somebody. In other words, what you learn, it looks like he's carrying out everything he purposed to carry out. But when you let out a praise out of your mouth and just don't worry about what people think and people's opinion, then all of a sudden you start throwing the enemy into confusion and they begin to turn on each other and let all the people say amen. I need to tell your neighbor something else. Say, we're about to have some fun. Genesis chapter 1. Okay. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. Okay. And God saw that it was good. Verse 10. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters he called seas. And God said, it is good. And the earth that brings forth grass and seed that yields fruit according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. God made two great lights, verse 16. The greater to rule by the day, the lesser to rule by the night. And when God saw the light that divided the darkness from the light, he said it was good. Verse 21. God created sea creatures. And after he'd finished, the Bible says, God saw it and said it is good. Verse 25, and God made every beast of the earth. And at the end, God saw it and said, it is good. Lord, bless the reading of your word and help me to communicate in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. Give me a few minutes to work this thing. It's one of the power, most powerful revelations God's ever given me. <clears throat> and I don't say that lightly, it really is. <clears throat> There's four things I want to tell you about sound. The first thing that God created was not light. The first thing God created was sound. And God said, let there be light. If he had not have said it, there would have been no light. Some of you, it is not happening because you have not yet made a sound. God rides on sound. Faith can't even be seen. Faith comes by hearing, by sound being made, and hearing by the word of God. Everything. Number one, whenever God wants something, stay with me, this is so powerful. Some of you deep thinkers, you're going to like this, it's deep. Whenever God wants something, he doesn't call out what he wants. He speaks to what holds it and tells what is holding it to turn it loose. Okay? God never said... Let there be corn, potatoes, tomatoes, and green beans and squash and zucchini. God said, let the earth bring forth. In other words, I've already put everything in the earth for food. Now earth, turn your potential loose. Because everything is already in you, now let it go. 
God never said, let there be Jupiter, Uranus, Mars, Saturn. God never said that. He said, let the heavens bring forth. Because everything was in the heavens that was needed to sustain every star, every planet, every Milky Way, every galaxy. God already put it there. So in other words, he told the heavens, turn loose of what I've already put in you. He didn't call what he wanted. He told what held it to let it go. God didn't say, let there be sea bass and let there be halibut and let there be, he didn't let there be flounder. He didn't say that. He said, let the waters bring forth because the waters already had potential for fish. The water already held potential for life. So he's commanded the water to turn loose what was already on the inside of it. Okay? Now, woo. So now when God speaks to us, let me back up. I got another one. Just thought of it. I ain't got any notes much on this, folks. When God wanted people, he spoke to himself. We were God's potential. God turned around, looked in the mirror and said, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. And when he spoke to himself, I popped out and you popped out. Come on, somebody. Because <laughs> life begins in heaven. Hallelujah. <laughs> so <laughs> now God speaks to your spirit. And when he speaks to your spirit, when God speaks to you, God's not doing things around you to make your life happen because your future is already in you. And so when God speaks to you, then your spirit has to let go of what God has already put in it. The greatest thing you can do is hear the voice of God. Because every time God speaks, that means there's something in your spirit that your spirit has to let go of. And that begins to create the next step that you walk into, and the next door that you will walk through. Who am I preaching to? And the next season that you walk out in your life. So whenever God wants something, remember this. He doesn't talk to what he wants. He talks to what holds it and says, let it go. I want somebody to say that with me. Say, let it go. Come on, say it three times. Say, let it go. Come on, third time. Say, let it go. Ah, give God a praise in this place. I'm going somewhere. I'm going somewhere with this. Ah. Now, everything in life follows the sound it makes. For those of you who are here in 2015, if I don't preach this as good, it's because I didn't have no time to prepare. Everything in life follows the sound it makes. Okay? The jet doesn't go left and the sound go right. The jet follows the sound it makes. The train is not heading west and you only hear it north. It follows the sound that it makes. If I want to find something, I follow where's the sound coming from. If I want to follow the siren, I follow the sound. Even when I can't see the light, I follow the sound. I follow the sound. Okay? So your life follows the sound you make. Here's where church people mess up so bad. We wait till something happens and then we make a sound. Instead of making a sound to make something happen. So something bad happens and we make a depressing sound. And because we keep making a depressing sound, something that was only meant to last a couple of days now has lasted six months. Because the sound is keeping it alive. <laughs> but instead, we should be speaking to make something happen. The Bible said, let the weak say I am strong. When? While you're still weak. So that makes you look like an idiot. When you sit there and you don't have two quarters rubbed together to buy a Coke at a Coke machine, and you're telling people how blessed you are, that makes you look ridiculous to people. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Come on, somebody. 
So in other words, it looks like foolishness to them, but in heaven it is God's wisdom. So when you are down to your last nickel, that's when you begin to say, I am the blessed of the Lord. I'm the seed of Abraham and his blessing falls on me. And the blessing of the Lord maketh one rich and he has no sorrow to it. Come on. And God, come on. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And he's given his people to eat of the fat of the land. That's what we got to do. And you don't do that once you've been blessed. You do it when you're on the bottom of life looking up and then that sound will reach down and pick you up and carry you where you want to go shout hallelujah <laughs> let the poor say I am rich and what the world don't understand is all you're doing is you're putting a sound in the direction you want your life to go you don't like the direction your life is headed, change the sound. Uh, so it can't be that simple. Oh, it's that simple. You don't like the way your marriage is, go into your house and change the sound. I can change your sound and change your husband's sound and I can change your marriage by changing the sound. <clears throat> don't like where your career's headed, walk into the office building and change the sound. You depressed, don't turn on the blues and pull down the shade. <laughs> what are you doing? You're locking yourself in an emotion that was meant to be temporary. But you're having a sound now that is causing it to remain long after its season is over. Okay? Every significant power, number three in the earth, is accompanied by a significant sound. In most cases, maybe not exhaustively, but 99% of the time, anything that has great power has great sound. I've lived through one tornado coming down the interstate following my car. I was coming out of Atlanta and I headed off on a, the ramp and ran inside, just left my car door open, ran inside this gas station and everybody there huddled inside of the, the beer freezer because that thing weighed a million pounds and it was bolted to the concrete. And I'm like, everything else is gonna go, but they're gonna protect their beer. I'm telling you that. <laughs> Kill the people, but don't let nothing happen to the beer. <laughs> and I remember the sound when that thing came over that building and the earth shaking as that tornado crossed over that bed. Why? <laughs> because anything that can yank a house off its foundation has a great sound. The force of hurricane winds, the sound they make when they whirl through the streets and whirl around the house because anything with great power is accompanied by great sound. How does that diesel 18 wheeler pull that 40,000 pound load? Because when you run by hot ride beside it, you can't hear yourself talk. Everybody that works at the airport, how do they make 200,000 tons fly 500 miles an hour? Because everybody at the airport is wearing earmuffs because of the sound of those engines. Anything that has great power is accompanied by great sound. Why has the devil spent so much time making churches quiet? You want to go to some of the most boring places on the face of the planet? What are powerful, what are powerful football games? The stadiums where the fans are rowdy. Because when you make a sound, what happens? It lifts everything in the building up. See, they don't even know about spiritual dynamics, but there's something happening when 70,000 people get up and your team is against the wall and they're about to score, but all of a sudden the crowd gets into the game and the team finds something that they didn't have before the tank team starts screaming. Why? Because power comes on the back of that sound. Who am I talking to in this place? Are you understanding what I'm saying today? Shout amen if you are. Ah, I'm going to keep going. Now, the Bible says God inhabits praise. <clears throat> Pardon me. The word inhabits means makes a dwelling place. <clears throat> 
So it doesn't say God lives in our church service. Because I've been in a lot of church services. God wasn't anywhere. I mean, God was down the road at Chick-fil-A. He was nowhere near that building. And just because we got up, cleaned up, and drove over here does not mean God is obligated to come in our midst. It doesn't say that God lives in our gathering, okay? It doesn't even say that God lives in my preaching. But it said God lives in praise. You want to assure yourself that there's never a dead service? Then build God a house. How do you build God a house? You build God a house with your praise. Your praise has to do with make, get, sing unto the Lord a new song and give him a great big sound, the sound of string instruments. <coughs> give him the sound of the cymbals. Give him the clanging of the cymbals. All these things are what God wants. If you ever look at God's people praising, it was not pretty. It was loud and it was chaotic. But God always inhabited it. <coughs> So if I want to experience a small God, then build him a small house. Just golf, golf course praising. <laughs> Open your mouth and shout him, amen. Okay, you've built God a small house, today you will experience a small God because you've made no room for him. But then you got those people that as soon as the first notes hit, they get out now. Because they need God in a big way. And you may need a small God to get you out of their problems, but they need a great. They need a big God for what they're dealing with. And so that's when you get out here and you just start getting a little crazy a little bit and you quit worrying about what people think and, and you just get your hands in the air and you start singing, you start shouting, you start spinning and hopping like everybody on the stage. And this is some of the next level stuff I'm talking about. God wants to come in a greater dimension than he ever has before. But we're going to have to praise him with a liberty and with a fervency like we've never praised him before. And that means we're going to have to come and be participants, not spectators, and open up our mouth and lift our hands and clap our hands and dance around and turn and sing and let the stringed instruments play, let the band play, let all the people of God dance. This is a next level move that I'm hearing God say, if you'll praise me like I say, praise me, I'll move like you've never seen me move. Give God 10 seconds of praise in this place. Five, four, three, two, shout hallelujah! Woo! <laughs> Tell your neighbor, say, this is getting good, this is getting good. This ain't even the best part yet. Hallelujah. Tell your neighbor, say, you got to sit down a minute. You got to sit down. <laughs> now, see, we got to come in like this when I'm not preaching on this. It's easy for this kind of release when all of our focus is on it. But your focus has got to be on it whether or not the focus is on it or not. <laughs> okay. So you control the size of God you experience. Ah, you know what, I just, I don't know, pastor wasn't on today. He's a little off, I just didn't. <laughs> I'm not in control. 
of how much God you experience. You can experience a big God if I'm having a terrible day. <laughs> because it's your praise that builds him a habitation, a dwelling place. Okay. Sound precedes any manifestation. Here again, it is human nature. I'm not bashing us, I'm just telling you what we're gonna have to intentionalize this. It is human nature to let life happen and then I respond. If it's good, I respond with happy sounds. If it's bad, I respond with all other kinds of sounds. Instead of getting up every day and commanding your morning and release the sound in which you desire your day to go. If you don't make a sound in your office, somebody will make one for you. And then you have to live with that sound. You do not have to put up with anyone else's atmosphere. You have the ability with your mouth to create any atmosphere you want. When I came here and I knew God wanted to do something great, there were two things I started on immediately. Changing the structure and changing the sound. Immediately, I went to work in those two areas because I know that you don't really rise to the level of your vision, you fall to the level of your systems. You corporate guys, y'all can give me a little offering after this for that right there. (laughs) So I started getting in the engine and working diligently, still am. But another thing was what we had up there and what we had up there, I wanted to change the sound because we've got to put a sound out there to where we want to go. And so I realized those were two immediate areas of need and we're still working on it. And I'm still diligent behind the scenes, pushing that envelope, pushing that envelope. This next level thing that God's wanting to do must be imminent or God wouldn't have me preaching about this today. So it must be, Ron, you gotta speak this because I'm ready to do what it is I wanna do. Okay. Sound precedes manifestation. There came a sound from heaven like a mighty rushing wind. Then tongues of fire set upon their head. The sound came first, then the fire. Ezekiel prophesied to the bones. Talk to them and they will live again. Oh God. A sound had to be made before life came back to dead things. Okay? Elijah said, I hear the sound of an abundance of rain after a three and a half year drought. And all he saw was this cloud the size of a man's hand. Can you see something as small as a man's hand and tell a whole country, I hear the sound. Don't don't look at what you see. Let me tell you what I hear, hallelujah. I hear the sound of an abundance of rain. And then what happened? It rained over all the land and the famine was broken and the drought was broken. But the sound came before the manifestation. God told Jehoshaphat, begin to praise. And when he praised them, the enemy was thrown into confusion and killed each other. God on the seventh day, on the seventh time around the walls of Jericho, he said, shout! And when you shout, the walls will begin to fall down. Not the walls fall and when you see them fall and start shouting. In other words, you shout when they're still standing up. And when you shout when they're still standing up, then that'll give you the power to see them fall. Everything God wants to do follows somebody making a sound. The things that you want to see, do you have the sound for it? Ah, all right. Uh, Teasy, give me a, give me something tribal. Oh my goodness.
And we're coming into the end of his camp. And we're not throwing our weapons down, but we're walking in and we're taking back those things that have been stolen from us. Everything, every, every bit of finances, every bit of peace, every bit of joy, every bit of healing, everything that's been stolen us, we're taking it back today. Does anybody want to march with me into the enemy? Look at y'all. I was just trying to prove a point. Okay, go ahead. Some of y'all look like I need to get something back. Go! Woo! Hey! Hallelujah! Just a little bit more. Just a little bit more. It took every bit of two seconds for y'all want to rip every demon's head off in California. But what happened? Your response came on the heels of a sound being put in the atmosphere and every one of y'all was ready to charge hell with a water pistol and take it over. Me just a few minutes. I still got about 10 minutes. I know it's late, but just hold on. Okay. Leave me beside still waters, Terrence. Raise it up, Brother Sound Man. Fill this room. Fill this room. Yeah. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Is there any peace in this room right now? Come on, give God praise. Are we getting close? Say, Pastor, what does this have to do with creation in Genesis 1 you read? God went through all of creation, created it, then stepped back and blessed it. Why? Because what he does has to be praised, and there was nobody there but him. So he praised himself. That's a bad God. He'd make something and step back and say, you did good. <laughs> He'd make something else and say, oh, you a bad God. He did it. He blessed it. He did it. He All through the creation narrative, except one thing. Go read your Bible today. He created something called the firmament. And when he got to the firmament, I think it's verse six, if you want to study it today, he got to that and he created it and he said, it is so. I see, you can't do that to me. When I see 10, it is goods, and one, it is so, I got to know why. There's where the revelation always is. It's in that stuff. Most theologians think that somewhere between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2 that that's when the fallout in heaven took place. It's not a hill I'm willing to die on one way or the other. It's up for a lot of debate, but we know it happened sometime. That Satan led a rebellion, a third of heaven was cast out. Where did they go? 
Where were they cast out to? Satan is not in hell. Revelation 19 and 20 says hell is reserved for him. So it preaches good and it sings good, but it's just not true. All the demons in hell. (laughs) There There are no demons in hell. In fact, the Bible says there's spiritual wickedness in high places. It's not under you. The Old Testament word firmament is the exact same word in the New Testament for air. And the Bible calls Satan the prince of the power of the... He's the prince or the pharaoh or the king of the firmament. The Bible describes three heavens and most scientists bear this out. The first one is the earth's atmosphere. It starts six inches above your head. There's stuff whirling around right now that if God gave you the ability to peer into it would freak you out. The warfare and everything that's going on right above, right in this room. The warfare that kept you safe driving here this morning. You have no idea how many angels were dispatched so that you could get seven, eight hours of sleep last night. (laughs) You have no idea. You just can't see it. The third heaven is the abode of God. It's where God lives. It's where John said, I was taken into the third heaven and God showed me the vision. The the book of Revelation is not a book, it's a vision. He wrote down what he saw and we call it a book. But in the middle, there's this second heaven called the firmament. When God was blessing everything, he created the firmament and refused to bless it because he knew that evil would dwell there. And there was no way he could bless an evil dwelling place. Now that presents me a dilemma because when Jesus was teaching us to pray, he said, pray that the kingdom would come on earth, number one, as it is in number three. which means it's got to pass through number. The one God wouldn't bless. The Bible says that you receive when you pray. Not when you receive, when you pray. Give me five minutes. So Daniel in the book of Daniel prayed and the Bible said God sent the angel, Gabriel, the messenger angel, with his answer. But it was three weeks later he showed up and he said, God sent me three weeks ago when you prayed. But I was detained by the prince of Persia. He said, when I was passing through number two, I come into great conflict because there was a strategy to keep this from showing up. So it's been delayed. So it's of no consequence that I'm finding in the Bible, just like there are three heavens, there are three levels of praise. The Bible says that the first level, all this is in the book of Psalms. I don't have the scriptures off the top of my head that there's a praise that silences the enemy. Now, it doesn't say that it's a clap or an emotion or an expression, so the only thing I can gather is that it's a level of intensity. There's a second level the Bible says steals the enemy. So there's a level of praise that this church can move into that stops all activity against you. First of all, you can shut him up and get his voice out of your head. And secondly, you can cease all activity against you with your praise. This is hidden in plain sight. This is warfare. This is stuff going on you can't see. But then there's this third level of praise that is the highest dimension. 
And the Bible calls it the shout. And the shout, the word shout means to take your enemy and tear apart piece by piece by piece. If I'm reading my Bible right, there is a level of intensity where I can shut him up. There's another level of intensity where I can render him ineffective. But there's a third level where if I'm reading it right, I can lessen the number against me. But if you go in churches across America now, we've got polished and we've gotten pretty and we've gotten click tracked and we've gotten a song service instead of a praise and worship service. We sing several songs before we preach and give you your t-shirt and we're missing the whole point of it. You don't warm them up with music. This is a time where you begin to assert yourself in the unseen realm and wreak havoc on your enemy and rearrange his assignment against you. This is a time where you increase the size of God that you want. Come on, somebody. This is a time where you understand you're breaking through the second heaven. Now, I got to stop. But we're going to have to lift up one shout. Go ahead and stand with me all over this building. (laughs) Now, you don't just do this at church. You do it all the time. How many of you have had something that you've been praying about a long time? What if God answered it the first time you prayed? But it's been held in another realm. And it only takes radical praisers to shake it loose. Can I tell you the weight of this moment? What if your shout released the last 10 years of unanswered prayers in your life in a day? I'll never ask you to do it without telling you the purpose of it. And I've drawn this thing out as good as I know how. But I think we need to take about 30 seconds and then I got to get you out of here because there's some other people going to be shouting at your parking space if I don't get you out of here. But I need you to lose your dignity and I need you to lose your status and how many successes you got and how many PhDs you got beside your name. Oh, that's good. I'm not not downing it. But right now is not the time for that. Right now is the time to become like David and say, I don't care who's watching. I don't care who's looking. I'm not trying to be dignified. I'm trying to build God a house. And I want someone to take 30 seconds and make the second heaven turn your blessings loose. Are you ready? Four, three, two. Give God a shout in this place. Hey! Come on, sustain it. Sustain it. Hallelujah! 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 Come on, sustain it, sustain it. Make them turn it loose. Make them turn it loose. Make them turn it loose. It ain't his. It's yours. Make them turn your son loose. Make them turn your daughter loose. Make them turn your blessing loose. Make them turn your healing loose. to show up tomorrow what's about to show up tonight what's being released you are making the second heaven hemorrhage because they haven't to let go of every one of your unanswered prayers oh 
Oh, somebody shout hallelujah. Tell three people say this isn't for church, this is for life. When you have past due prayers, find yourself a place with God, become undignified, and give God the most foolish praise you've ever given Him in your life, and see if breakthrough doesn't come. I love you, God bless you. I can't wait to hear what's about to happen this week.